Hello. Today, I will share with you a couple of videos on a subject that you will see shortly to be extremely important for the end times. I titled the two videos from Delta to Thalipsis. Uh, the word Delta, <coughs> you would know from newspaper reports, the media reports, refers to the current latest variant of the deadly COVID-19 virus that is mutating into worse forms of the virus. And the latest version is Delta, even Delta Plus. The question is, where are we headed beyond this pestilence of COVID-19? And the Bible has the answer for us towards the ellipsis. Now, you see very shortly that the Greek word the ellipsis stands for tribulation. Yes, affliction, persecution. Let me begin by quoting the words of our Savior, Yeshua, in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, reading from verses 5 to 13. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So what we are seeing is that if you think of a, a, a woman in her pregnancy about to deliver, she begins to suffer birth pangs contraction in the uterus that will ultimately result in birth. So what we're seeing is that the birth pangs, just like the birth pangs of a pregnant woman about to deliver, gradually increase in frequency and in intensity. The pain likewise increases with each birth pang. So what we are, the world is experiencing recently, in recent years, is what Yeshua described as the beginning of sorrows. Now the Greek word for sorrows is actually birth pangs, it should be translated as birth pangs. For example, ethnic conflicts. In America, you've got BLM, Black Lives Matter, You've got the extremist white organizations uh, that the Proud Boys, among others, uh, that seek um, dominance for their particular race. And it's not just confined to America, it's all over the world. And in Singapore, there have been instances of um, uh, racial slurs uh, being, being um, thrown at people of minority races. All of these denote ethnic conflicts. They are, of course, terribly wrong. No one should 
assert the superiority of one race over another because we're all made in his image. So in addition to ethnic conflicts, we know that there are actual military conflicts, wars, certainly rumors of wars, famines in different places in the world, earthquakes and pestilences, the latest of which is COVID-19 that is now into, well, into his second year, and um, which is not showing signs of really abating, but rather it seems to be evolving into more serious variants like Delta and Delta Plus, which are not only uh, spread much more easily, but appears to be to target um, younger people and more severely than previously. So, despite the vaccines that we have, nobody is projecting that life can get to normal anytime soon. Look at the huge disruption in air travel, tourism especially, and uh, the movements of people across boundaries. So what comes next? Well, according to Yeshua, the next sorrow is persecution or affliction or tribulation. All three are expressed by the Greek word thlipsis, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S, thlipsis. Now, let me quote from a well-known Greek word study on the website of Precept Austin Organization about the word tribulation. So let me quote. Tribulation, the Greek number 2347, thelipsis, or the Greek word thlibo, thlibo, which means to crush, to press together, squash, to hem in, to compress, to squeeze in turn, which derived from the word theo to break, originally expressed sheer physical pressure on a man. The ellipsis is a strong term which does not refer to minor inconveniences but to real hardships." Unquote. So there you are. We are in for a time of immense pressure, pain, that's right, the likes of which perhaps we've never experienced before. Now, interestingly, if you read the book of Revelation chapter 6 and you open up the fifth seal, the fifth seal is about persecution of Christians unto death. And let me read the relevant verses for you. That's Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Verse 10. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. This is the fifth seal. Now you may know that you've got to begin with the first seal, which Yeshua in heaven will be opening. And to many commentators, that denotes the last seven years of the current world history before Yeshua comes in blazing glory at his second coming. And I have um, shown you in two previous, in a previous video on the rapture, the possible scenario of the pre-tribulation rapture. That means the rapture would take place 
just before the seven year period. Therefore, if the persecution, the tribulation, that uh, the affliction that Yeshua referred to is in fact the same as the fifth seal and what goes be before the fifth seal, we should understand that events are galloping on, that the rapture can happen now any moment, and that we are soon to be in the last seven years. We'll talk about the last seven years uh, very shortly into the video. But let us take a step backwards and ask ourselves a very important question, which many Christians are perplexed about. Because what we are talking about in terms of tribulation is immense suffering on the part of Christians, followers of Christ. But we must get back to the basic question, why do Christians suffer? Or why should Christians suffer? This, the most problematic issue that pastors everywhere have to face in counseling church members is about suffering. Because we all know Christians get sick, they suffer losses, they suffer tragedies, they suffer false accusations, they suffer persecution even unto death, they suffer divorces, suffer loss of jobs, loss of homes. That's why. And in a pandemic, they suffer COVID-19 as well. Remember one of my earlier videos where I, I uh, told you what Peter wrote? That judgment must begin with the household of God. So don't expect in the pandemic to get off scot-free just because uh, you are a Christian. You may well be the first target if you are not careful. So question is, why? Why must this be so, O oh Lord? Didn't Yeshua promise us the abundant life? And don't we hear from a lot of prosperity and faith teachers that preach prosperity, preach good health as the norms of Christian life? Why then do Christians fare poorly compared to non-Christians? Well, to answer at least one of the questions in short, uh, it's simply that the faith prosperity teachers are all false teachers and false prophets and promise things that don't exist in the Bible. And I have another video that shows you the abundant life that Yeshua referred to does not necessarily refer to abundance in material things. It is actually above all abundance in terms of spiritual development, spiritual riches, the fruits of the Spirit, and the prospect of going to heaven to enjoy Him forever and ever. Okay, so the Bible actually gives us several reasons, several explanations about the sufferings of Christians. First of all, first of all, and you may not like it, we suffer on account of our own sins. Let me just refer to you, you to a few verses in Deuteronomy 28. I'm going to read only from verses 15 to 21, but you should read the rest of the chapter for the rest of the curses that come upon people when they sin against Yahweh. So, verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe all, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city, cursed shall thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket 
and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kin and the uh, flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou sets thy hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, until thy thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. In verse 21, the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he has consumed thee from the land whither thou goest to possess it. These verses and the rest of the chapter, of course, were addressed to the nation of Israel, but they apply equally to all of us because the Torah was given not just to Israel, it was given through Israel to the whole world, applicable to every man, uh, every person in the entire world. So, we suffer because of our sins. And this is confirmed for us in <coughs> First Peter, first letter of Peter, <coughs> chapter 4 and verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. And you will understand that if somebody kills somebody else, and you, I'm talking about Christians, the law of the land may dictate that you be hanged until you are dead, or you may be sent to life imprisonment. You can be flogged for certain offenses and so on, and penalties and fines and so on. This is just earthly punishment dealt out by governments uh, everywhere. But in the spiritual, in the physical, there's the impact of the suffering inflicted by Yahweh himself because of our sins. So typically, when people come for ministry, and they are sick. The first issue I have to address is their sins. They need to confess and repent of their sins. And then the Holy Spirit sometimes will reveal to the word of knowledge the specific sin or sins that brought about the sickness that a person is experiencing. So these things are very spiritual and very, very real, okay? And there are any number of preachers that just stretch forth their hand and proclaim healing when Yahweh has not healed. And you cannot deal with healing without dealing with sin. And remember, if you read the four Gospels, that virtually every time that Yeshua heals somebody or cast out demons or somebody, he always added the injunction, go your way and sin no more, lest something worse befalls you. So that, that really confirms for us that a lot of sicknesses that we um, experience is the result of sin and judgment by Father Yahweh. But we'll do some qualification to this statement a bit later on. So that's suffering on account of our own sins. The Bible also tells us that some of the suffering that we have is actually on account or because of our forefathers' sins. So let me read to you some relevant verses from the book of Exodus in chapter 20. I read from verse 4 to 6. <clears throat> Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I 
Yahweh, thy Elohim, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So you can see the most immediate reason for the um, curses visited upon children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren unto the fourth generation has to do with idolatry, the making of graven images and the bowing down to such. That's the most serious sins. And of course, other commandments are broken uh, will likewise have this same effect. That means that Yahweh will visit the iniquity of the forefathers unto the fourth generation. And think of the compounding effect. If subsequent generations repeat the sins or commit other sins and are unrepentant, it goes down another four generations and on and on and on. So you can see the multiplication effect uh, throughout all the generations. You can see very obvious examples of this. Cancer, strokes, heart attacks, mental illness, all these, all these are most of the cases genetically, or what we call medically, genetically transmitted. Very often in insurance uh, uh, policy applications, uh, you are asked a question, uh, did any member of your family suffer a stroke or heart attack or whatever, whatever, okay? So you want uh, coverage for critical illnesses and so on, like cancer, that would be a question about cancer. Why is that? Because the likelihood of recurrence of the same disease down the generations is experienced very often. So there you are. And don't forget something else. We are where we are with the curses of Yahweh upon the entire earth and upon us because of one sin, one transgression by Adam and Eve. They were only given one commandment they transgress, the whole earth is accursed. There are tremendous, women experience tremendous pain in childbirth. Lives, life expectancy is greatly shortened. Adam and Eve were not expected to die. Now, and the initial generations live almost a thousand years. But gradually, Yahweh shortened the lifespan to 120, and now it's 70 to 80, and very rarely above 80, and very even rarer above 100. All this because of sin and the curse that came upon sin, one sin. And you might want to remember that the sin of Adam and Eve involved eating the forbidden fruit. So when people complain about Leviticus 11, <clears throat> which is about a prohibition about eating unclean foods, and Christians complain, <coughs> and Christians were to set aside the commandment in Leviticus 11, and simply pray over the pork and over the shellfish, whatever they love to eat, they forget this thing. That's right. One commandment against eating forbidden fruit. How about Leviticus 11? You think you can flout that commandment? In Leviticus 11, you think again. Okay. So, let me <coughs> read for you some relevant verses to what I'm saying. In the First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now, is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? Verse 21 For since by man came death, 
by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Verse 21, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now this being alive, made alive is talking about the resurrection of the dead. Yes, everyone who dies physically or has died physically since Adam and Eve will be resurrected. Okay? First resurrection, resurrected to glory. Second resurrection, resurrected unto damnation. But all will come to life again. All will have new bodies. Some will make it to heaven. Most others will go down to hell forever and ever. So in Adam, all die. In Christ, all shall be made alive. But in Christ, you want to make sure you're among those that will be resurrected in the first resurrection and taken up to heaven with our new bodies, hopefully at the rapture. But even for those who die before, they're in Christ, walking righteously before him, they will partake of the first resurrection unto eternal life. Look at uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And then Romans chapter 5 again, verse 17 to 19. For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance <coughs> of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. This is what Yeshua has done for us. This is what our salvation is all about. This is what redemption is all about. But please note, uh, important caveat that although although the sins of the forefathers are visited physically, mentally upon their descendants in this life, in this world, each person will only face eternal death on account of his own sins. And here I refer to the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear <coughs> the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now, the words here, shall die, does not mean physical death, because that issue has already been settled since the sin of Adam and Eve that all their descendants will die physically. Ezekiel 18 is talking about the second death, eternal damnation, condemnation. So it's reassuring to us that our forefathers' sins, no matter how grievous, how serious they are, will not result in our being sent to hell for all eternity, because all of us, still have a chance for salvation, provided we come to Christ, walk in his footsteps, walk in obedience to him. And likewise, just because your father was righteous, he was a pastor, a godly man, doesn't mean that his righteousness can be transferred to you, his son or his grandson. Remember, I said more than once, God is a father, is not a grandfather, not a great grandfather. By that is meant each one of us have to find our relationship with him, that he would be our father and we are accounted as worthy 
to be called his son, to be accepted, to be adopted by him eventually as his sons and daughters. How glorious that would be. So there you are. The effects of the consequences of the sins of the forefathers, they have temporal consequences, temporal adverse consequences on us, but they cannot affect our eternal consequences. Uh, that must be settled between Yahweh and ourselves. That depends upon how we relate to Yahweh, to his dear son, Yeshua, who died on the cross for our sins nearly 2,000 years ago. And you and I must repent of our sins and accept what Yeshua has done for us and allow his power, his special grace, special enablement to walk a godly life, a righteous life before him, walking in obedience all the days of our lives. This is what salvation is all about. Okay, then note something else. Not only do we suffer because of the sins of our forefathers, but we suffer also because other people's sins around us. That's right. We are living in a sinful world where wicked people kill, they steal, they destroy, they rape. Look at the hundreds of millions of people who died in the Second World War caused by a man called Hitler. The millions caused by a man called Stalin. The millions who perished in China because of Mao Zedong's uh, Great Leap Forward program. Look at America today. So sad. Hardly a day goes by without some shooting incident in which bystanders get killed or injured. And the bystanders could well be Christians in addition to non-Christians. So we suffer because of other people's sins. The greed of other people can impact us. Look at the extreme poverty in the world. So many people are going to bed hungry, not because there's not enough food, but because of inequitable distribution of food, inequitable distribution of income, inequitable distribution of wealth. Look at potable water. 40% of the people in the world have no access to drinking water, potable water. So it really shows us that we ought to treasure the food that is given to us, the water that is given to us, and give thanks to Yahweh every day, and let us not waste any food that is set before us. Let us not waste precious drinkable water. Conserve all the water that you can. Think of those doing without. Now we address a related issue, because I've been talking about the curses that come upon us because of our sins. So people will raise the question, Christians often raise this question, but uh, brother, didn't Yeshua take all our curses upon himself? And they would turn or refer to the book of Galatians and chapter 3, uh, verses 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Yeshua the Messiah, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So people use these verses to say, look, why do you say that I get sick because of the sins of my forefathers, the curses come down to the generations? What about these verses? Well, let me reiterate the following important points. Violation of every commandment of Yahweh results in a curse of sickness, distress of some kind. That is because his word mandated it. Remember, violation of only one commandment by Adam and Eve was enough 
to result in having the whole human race condemned to eternal damnation. Plus the compounding effect of our own sins, of course. Thirdly, what Yeshua has done is to redeem us from eternal damnation, the second death. Although there's healing in him, in his name, because Isaiah 53 says, he took our infirmities on himself. There is no promise in the Bible of healing in every case of sickness. Let me repeat. There's no promise anywhere in scripture that Yahweh, because of Yahshua's sacrifice on the cross, will heal every sickness, every disease. No such promise. And you look at Yahshua's own ministry. You read through the entire four Gospels. What would you find? You will find that there were occasions where all who came to him got healed. But there are many other occasions where he healed selectively. One or two. That's right. The most outstanding example of what I'm saying is the pool at Bethesda. Remember, there was this pool and there are lots of people who are sick, crippled, crowding around the pool. And apparently, every once in a while, an angel will appear and stir the pool. Whoever managed to jump in first will get the healing. So, Yeshua visited this pool one day and saw a man crippled for many, many years. And he asked him about, did he wish to be healed? He said, yes. He said, but every time the angel stirs the pool, other people jump in before I can get into the pool. I got no chance. And that day, Yeshua healed him. But you want to know something else. There were hundreds at the pool. He didn't heal the rest of them. Just this one person. Another example Remember the, the cripple at the gate of the temple in Jerusalem? Peter and John passed by one day and then stretched forth to heal him. Now that guy had been there for many, many years. Yeshua would have passed him by any number of times when he went up the temple to pray or to worship. But he never got healed until the timing of Yahweh through the hands of Peter and John. And if you look at the ministries of the apostles, throughout the Acts of the Apostles to the Epistles, you'll find that they did not heal everyone, but rather selectively as the Holy Spirit directed. Now it's very important that this, um, this issue be settled in your mind as a, as a Christian. And that is number one. Should you need healing, you're sick. First thing is repent, repent, repent of every sin that you can remember. Repent of <coughs> any sins of your forefathers <coughs> and wait upon the timing of Yahweh. If it is his will to, to heal you, he will. Okay? But if not, you have to suffer the consequences. Okay. So, therefore, we can conclude that the curses of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, from verses 15 to 68, the end, apply. And we must depend on the mercy of Yahweh in each case of need. We cannot be presumptuous like the faith and prosperity teachers because of whom many have died of COVID-19. If you search YouTube, you'll find any number of videos where these faith prosperity preachers and teachers who rebuke COVID-19 in their churches. And what happened? People continue to die and to get infected among their congregation. The latest one was a member of the Hillsong Church in California. And as he lay dying, 
he regretted he didn't take the vaccine because he was trusting that Yahweh will heal him. He despised the vaccine and he had been taught in the church to believe in healing directly from Father Yahweh. That is presumptuousness. When we get sick, ask Yahweh, should I go see a doctor? He will tell you. There are times he told me to see a doctor. There are times he told me not to see a doctor. And both times I got healed, one without a doctor and directly by Yahweh, the other one through the doctor by the hand of Yahweh. So Yahweh works through vaccines. Yahweh works through doctors. Hospitals are there, are there for us. So don't be presumptuous. Don't be presumptuous. And I dare say something else, that because of the presumptuousness of many Christians and their false teachers and pastors, COVID-19 is spreading like wildfire. Because in places like America, Australia and so on, there are so-called so -called Christian nations, they, um, they preach healing. And they expect healing from Yahweh. And they teach their people that they're immune to COVID-19 because they're under special protection by Father Yahweh. But they become super spreaders of the virus. Look at my videos on COVID-19. And there's one video I did where we are told to hide themselves in thy chambers till the indignation is over, till the indignation of Yahweh is past. So don't be presumptuous. And I want to add another note that because of the presumptuousness of large numbers of Christians, and by the way, South Korea is another good example of churches defying the government on the lockdowns, uh, not the prohibitions to, uh, to gather together in worship in large numbers. The result is super spreading of the virus. And this is going to result in something else. This is going to, to plant the idea of persecution against Christians very shortly. They will become Christians, will become the target of persecutions in many countries because of COVID-19, because of their resistance to the vaccine, because of their false doctrines about COVID-19. All right, so let me add another very important issue and that is that suffering can occur by Yahweh's design so as to show forth his works that he will be glorified. Now this may, this may sound strange uh, to most Christians but this is true. You turn to one example about the man who was born blind in John's Gospel, chapter 9, <coughs> reading from verses 1 to 3. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And he stretched forth his hand and healed the blind man. Interesting. The, the Jews, which are probably the Pharisees, when asked the questions of Yeshua, understood from scriptures that sickness can come because of one person's sins, Deuteronomy 28, because of forefathers' sins, Exodus 20, that we read out earlier. They were spot on two key reasons but they didn't realize there's a third reason behind sickness behind this stress and that is that Yahweh will be glorified when the healing eventually takes place now of course we do not know beforehand which case belongs to which category but this is a fact let me give you another example you probably know about Helen Keller was, was uh, deaf and blind from the age of two, famous pianist and famous author. 
Let me give you a couple of quotes now and one more later. Quote, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. Unquote. Quote again, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Unquote. These are two beautiful quotes. And the first one, you see, we who are blessed with normal eyesight, we can see things around us, but what do we do with our eyesight? Most of the time we sin with our eyes, but we lack something which is more important. What cannot be seen or touched, but that is of the heart. Because the heart is capable of responding to Yahweh, responding to his love, responding to his salvation. That's right, responding to his voice. And Helen, being deaf and blind, was all, the heart was all attentive to the Lord. She could hear, she could see, perceive, feel with the heart which most people with normal sight cannot. And then look at her uh, important uh, quote that the thing being worse, which is worse than being physically blind, is having no vision. And of course, she's referring to spiritual vision. In the book of Proverbs, there's a prophet that says, without vision, the people perish. We need to have spiritual vision spiritual eyesight, not merely physical eyesight. Let me turn to another important issue, Mongoloid children. You probably have seen examples of them uh, everywhere. <clears throat> they look strange. They all have a certain look that makes them look alike. Okay, So let me read first from Psalms 139 verses 13 to 16. Psalm 139, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and my soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from thee, when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of me. Everyone, normal as well as Mongolite, can say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. It might shock you to address this issue or to address these verses of Psalms 139, the Mongolite children. But let me show you something else. So-called normal babies, normal children, normal human beings, are born with 46 chromosomes. A Mongolite child has 47, otherwise known as trisomy 21, D-R-I-S-O-M-Y 21. And I quote from a source, Although trisomy 21 causes intellectual and physical challenges, it is also true that with appropriate support and treatment, many people with Down syndrome lead happy and productive lives. My wife and I often joke that the hardest part of raising a child with Down syndrome is having to deal with people that do not have Down syndrome. Raising Natalia has helped me understand the danger of reducing a person's potential to her genetic profile. Although it has been unquestionably a lonely road for our family, Natalia's humor and perseverance through adversity have brought us joy and a sense of purpose. In the course of loving and caring for my daughter, I come to realize that the image of God does not need to be thought of as an inventory or a checklist of desirable human traits. 
despite her evident challenges, God's image is displayed all over Natalia's life, not by means of her specific skills or talents, but by virtue of the one who endowed her with such capabilities. Her contagious belly laugh and her dancing abilities are a reflection of her purpose rather than a justification of her worth. I've come to understand God's image upon individuals with and without congenital impairments as a divine seal <coughs> that denotes our intrinsic worth despite the presence or absence of any given feature." Unquote. This is by a man called Samuel L. Caraballo, and the title of his short article, Down Syndrome and the Image of God. And the website is available, biologos.org stroke articles, when you find the Down Syndrome and the Image of God article. Now, what a beautiful testimony. But unfortunately, you know something else. That because of scanning, you can detect mongoloid uh, features in fetuses. And this has resulted in abortions of a lot of mongoloid babies. I'm told that in Iceland, that there are virtually no more mongoloid uh, babies being birthed because the fetuses are already being aborted. Now, this is a horrible thing that has taken place. Scanning has become a curse. Scanning has become a murder weapon in countries like China and India because of the preference, oriental preference for male heirs. Baby daughters are aborted once they are identified, the gender is identified in the womb. So whether gender or mongolite features or other physical impairments and so on, innocent fetuses have been aborted. And so as Christians, we must stand against all these abominations. Let me pause for this part of the video and continue shortly in part two of uh, the same subject. Shalom for now. <laughs> 